declaring a national emergency. New York has the greatest need in terms of numbers. These families, these lost souls. The federal government is distributing more than 8 million N95 respirators. Social distancing is evident almost everywhere. This number of new claims for unemployment benefits is truly unprecedented. We can't let the economy collapse. We have a bipartisan agreement on the largest rescue package in American history. China doesn't want the real story to be told. The Chinese regime's propaganda arm is trying to shift the blame. Blame on the United States. It's not gonna happen, not as long as I'm president. It's not a Chinese virus, it's not a Wuhan virus. This is the CCP virus. Welcome to Zoom in Coronavirus Special. I'm Simone Gao. President Trump said at yesterday's White House briefing that he was considering easing the social distancing after the 15 days. He also said we cannot make the cure worse than the problem. Congress is likely to pass the $2 trillion stimulus plan. How big of a help would that be? I will discuss these questions with Steve Bannon, host of War Room Pandemic today. Mr. Bannon, how are you? Hi, Simone. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you. So President Trump said yesterday that uh, we are going to be opening up our country for business because our country was meant to be open. We are going to get it all going again very soon. Uh, he did not give a timeline of when he will open up the country again. And also he said uh, this is not going to be a one size fit all measure. Nevertheless, he made this comment on the day when the number of confirmed cases reached over 40,000 and 100 people died in a single day for the first time. So obviously we have not reached the peak of this pandemic. So do you think the president's approach is on the right track on this? I think he's I think he's looking to do the right thing. I, as you know, I went on TV this past weekend and I have a different alternative, which is basically drop the hammer. And I think if we look at the examples, you know, Simone, uh, it's given my great love of the Chinese people and China as a country uh, that I was fortunate enough to, to um, uh, broadcast into China uh, with some of the expatriate Chinese leading up to uh, Lunar New Year back in around January 15th, 16th, 17th. And I knew then from my contacts in China that, you know, the, the, uh, some sort of SARS virus was blowing up in, uh, in Ubay, in uh, province in Wuhan. Well, if you look at how the Chinese shut down and quarantined Wuhan and shut down Ubay, and then if you look at the, all the uh, mistakes that were made by the Italians, to me it's pretty evident that you, half measures don't work here that you've really got to do a full shutdown. So my advice to the president is that absolutely, we can't let the economy collapse. Everybody know, everybody agrees with that. That's what this stimulus package is basically meant to, uh, to augment or to kind of bridge, uh, you know, the drop in aggregate demand so we can get to the other side of this. But I, I don't even like what they're doing now. I don't think it's hard enough. I would have gone to a much bigger national lockdown of, uh, of the United States and really, really actually put New York City in much more of almost a quarantine like Wuhan. I, I would have much tougher measures for a certain period of time. I mean, we, we know from looking at uh, China and South Korea and Italy, it takes you about four to six weeks if you really do a, a lockdown to get through this. And, and if President Trump extends out the next couple of weeks to, to Easter, he would have already done four weeks. I just think you can do much more than the, the social distancing we're doing. So my advice to the president is, number one, get a, uh, a stimulus package that takes care of the entrepreneurs and the little people, right? The, the workers and uh, the, 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 um, the job creators of the entrepreneurs of the, of the, you know, the people that own small businesses that may cost you $2 trillion. It may cost you $3 trillion. It doesn't matter whatever the cost of it, that is, it is. And but for the amount of time you need to basically uh, shut this shut down hard and make sure the virus doesn't have any host bodies to get into. We have to defeat, we have to defeat the virus. It's just, we don't have an alternative. And so I would recommend a hard shutdown, uh, until we know we defeated it. Because uh, what's disturbing to me, the numbers you just mentioned, 
It's not the 40,000 uh, absolute number. We announced yesterday, I think, 13,500 new cases uh, and over 100 dead. We're accelerating at an accelerating rate. And that's the part of the up, you know, the, the chart that goes up. We're still on the ascendancy. In fact, Governor Cuomo said that today. And he said that, you know, they had miscalculated New York. He's going to need 140,000 new uh, hospital beds. So to me, uh, we should be going in a, in a drop the hammer, hard lockdown, bridge, a financial bridge. So no company misses a payroll and no individual misses a paycheck. We do that. We bridge it to the other side. We'll be fine. Mm, OK, so the president believes that we can do two things at the same time, containing the pandemic and saving the economy. Uh, but you think we should really just drop the hammer right now? It's a false. It's a false. It's a false. It, hang on. It's a false choice. I didn't say not saving the economy. You have to. You right now. It's not about opening businesses. It's about. It's about. It's about crushing it by putting in cash to bridge the drop in aggregate demand. We've had a massive drop in aggregate demand because everybody's inside or everybody's not going to work. Or everybody's not buying. We clearly have to. We have to. You have to infuse cash to take care of that. So we can't let the economy collapse. I, I, I 100% agree with the president on that. I'm saying that on a temporary basis, you can bridge that with cash from the Treasury, right? And, but still do a harder lockdown to make sure that we get through this and we kill the virus. In other words, you know, if you take everybody off the streets and everybody social distance, but you do almost a hard, not quarantine, but a lockdown. But I would quarantine New York. Absolutely. I quarantine New York right now because I think New York could turn into a Wuhan and you don't want that. You want to get ahead of that. Um, so I'm not I'm not for crashing the economy. Uh, and uh, but I don't believe you can do two things at one time. I do not. I just don't believe that you can open this thing back up with the, with the virus still where it is and all these hot spots around the country. I just don't think it works. First off, I don't know if the governors are going I don't know if the governors are going to do it. I don't know if the businesses are going to open up because of liability. You have these massive you have all the leagues. The reason all the leagues shut down, all the business shut down is a contingent liability. If somebody gets this disease and spreads it to other people and these people die, who's to say they can't come back and sue you for millions of dollars? That's why all the sports arena shut down. It was all contingent liability. Well, that's that's going to exist if you try to open up the economy and the and the virus is still around. Right. Uh, Governor Cuomo said a few days ago that uh, this is a war. And we see the enemy approaching very quickly, but our defenses are not in place. So what's your uh, what's your estimation of where New York, the state of New York is and also this, uh, the city of New York is right now? New York's going to be New, New York's could potentially be the city of New York could potentially be Wuhan. And I think that we have to get ahead of it uh, that much. I think you could have if if. You know, this is a situation you could have thousands of uh, of casualties. I agree with Governor Cuomo. I, we were the first ones here at, at War Room Pandemic back in January to call President Trump. When President Trump made the bold decision, you see, he's made bold decisions in this in this war when he shut down all traffic from China and quarantined people. We called him that day a wartime president because this is a war. And you have to be on war footing. That's what I'm saying. The Treasury and the Federal Reserve are on war footing now. You know, the 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 F, the Fed has put in, I think, three or four trillion dollars already into capital markets to support the debt markets, and uh, and to basically support the stock market. We've done another quantitative easing. We've supported the money market funds. They they're on war footing. They're on, they're on as big a war footing as they were in World War II, and so is the Treasury Department. No, I think Governor Cuomo's done a terrific job. Um, I, I think that their preparation, they may have been a little behind in their preparation, both in the city and the state. They're trying to make up for that, make up for lost time. But let's pray they do. But I, if I was the governor and the mayor, I would take much, much, much tougher measures in New York City right now just to get ahead of this. I don't think you lose anything by taking tougher measures. Right. That's right. Uh you know, talking about government help, um, Congress is likely to pass a $2 trillion stimulus package today. What do you think of this package? I'm not so sure it's going to pass today. I would like to have it passed today. Uh, I think the stimulus package is, look, it's, it's got certain, obviously, imperfections. Anytime you do something like this, you're always going to have complaints. I think to the degree that it deals with um, uh, the, the small entrepreneur, 
and the and the way it gets cash, particularly in unemployment insurance, uh, to the individuals, to the to the workers. It's positive. I think it's some of the stuff on the on the on the corporate side, maybe a little, uh, you know, corporate welfare. But I think you may have to just live with that to get this thing done. I just want to get it done quickly. But anything that's not Nancy Pelosi put up a bill that had all this other stuff uh, associated with it, and um, you know, not associated with actual the thing of getting cash in. I didn't think that was particularly helpful. That we should only focus on this crisis. Look, this package is the first step. I don't think it's the only one. Because I think it could take us more than $2 trillion, and all the $2 trillion is not to- totally to bridging it. I think probably $1.2 trillion. I think it could take us over $2 trillion just to bridge what I call this gap in aggregate demand because everything's falling through the floor. And it's absolutely imperative. No company should be forced to miss a payroll, and no individual sh- should miss a paycheck. And that ought to be the mantra we have and if that's the focus, it's going to be good. So I'm a big believer. I do believe it has to pass as soon as possible. I was very upset that it didn't pass over the weekend. I think people need this money and need this cash this week. And we've got to make sure it happens. Right. Comparing this with uh, 2008. In 2008, the government helped the banks, the, you know, the big businesses and stuff. Uh, what's the difference between 2008 and this time? And who should the government really help this time? So it's here's the thing. If you look at the way we've done the show since the beginning, and the reason I think our show is unique is that we look at the pandemic. We look at the economic crisis that was caused by the pandemic, both the short term perturbations like we're talking about now, plus the deeper issues about supply chain. First, the medical supply chain, you know, what what it turns out China makes and we don't. Then the deeper issues, the systemic issues on supply chain. So we look at that. But we also are unique in that we also now look at the financial crisis, which is on top of that. A pandemic and an economic crisis caused uh, this financial crisis. This financial crisis, to me, is two or three times worse than 2008. 2008 was about financial instruments in the banks, but we could shore that up. Now, it took us $4 trillion, $5 trillion to, to short up, maybe more. Here, you've had a complete meltdown of every asset class in every capital market through the, in the entire world. And we have shredded value and we've shredded the pension funds throughout the world. So this has had, uh, this has had massive economic carnage that it is going to take us, I think, many, many, many years uh, to work ourselves out of. And remember, all of this money we're infusing into the system, the 2 and $3 trillion now, the $4 trillion we're putting in the Fed to back up the corporate credits, everybody under... 50 years old is going to have to pay that money back. So this has had tremendous economic carnage. It's really been devastating to the world. So we were talking about the uh, comparison to 2008. If this is much bigger than 2008, and this year is the election year, obviously the economy is the most essential part for President Trump's re-election. He indicated that he wants to save lives and an economy at the same time. He wants to open up businesses. And you said saving the economy by infusing money into the system instead of opening up businesses. So I think that depends on one thing, how long this pandemic will last. Obviously, the federal government can't carry all business over for a, a couple of years. So so what is your assessment of uh but it's not. But but it's not. It, but it's no one said a couple of years. Look at the Chinese. Look at the Chinese example. Look at all the examples around the world. It takes four to six weeks if you do the hard work, uh, and particularly more you quarantine. The harder you do to smash the curve, the harder you do to smash the virus. Uh, the quicker you get through it. If you have to go through hell, go through it as fast as possible. That's the theory. And so it's not years. It's years if you don't do anything and you have a bigger second wave and a third wave. What you have to do is take hard measures. You know, it's like any complex system. You must take draconian action down front, down early. And so, um, no, that's why I've advocated. We've already, by the way, by tomorrow, you will have passed and signed the first, um, I don't even call it a stimulus bill. I call it a relief bill of almost $2 trillion that has the mechanics set up to actually bridge the gap here in, uh, you know, for the for the, the the loss of aggregate demand or essentially the country shutting down. So we, we've put in the first phase of the bridge, the financial bridge. Now, to me, you should follow that up with a hard shutdown. 
you think the federal government definitely has the money to carry businesses over for four to six weeks? Oh, sure. We have look. We have the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. We have. We could go. You know, look. We've Simone. We've done six trillion dollars in the last. 10 days, you know, $4 trillion have go- has gone in from the Federal Reserve to liquidity. You know, as I talked about, that third element of this is a financial crisis. $4 trillion has gone in to basically back up trading in the U.S. Treasury market, the bond market, the money markets, to kind of make sure there's liquidity in those markets. So the Fed has already infused massive amounts of capital into that. And and, and at zero interest rates, we could we could go another trillions and trillions of dollars. It's It's not... The fact of do we have the money? It's a fact of how quickly do you get through the pandemic? That's why the thinking's in reverse, and you can't think as a, it's not an either or. It's a you must do both at the same time. Either or is a very naive way to look at this. President Trump still talks about the phase one trade deal with China, and he said uh, China is going to fulfill that trade deal, and phase two trade deal is going to start very soon. So, do you think a phase one trade deal will even hold? Phase one trade deal is irrelevant. I mean, the total purchases of, you know, it's two hundred billion dollars, but you just did two trillion dollars. You could make up for the the trade deal. We don't even know where the agriculture's got to go. If the Chinese people need it, obviously they should be able to purchase it. Um, and and I assume they're going to stick to the terms of it. We're not going to ease up, but it's it's kind of in the grand scheme of things, not particularly as relevant as it was. Also, I think it's, in in addition, it's about the accountability of the CCP. Uh, you know, Josh Hawley, a senator, has put forward a motion that uh, everybody that takes a penny in this bailout money, which will basically be a, a, almost every corporation, will have to immediately start to bring the supply chain back. There's others like myself are trying to push that anybody that takes this type of money has to immediately sue the Chinese Communist Party in federal court to get the, to get the money back. There's, there's a discussion. Naval War College professor put up that the CCP absolutely has liability for this. Larry Clayman. Who's a, who's a strike lawyer here in uh, in the United States? Put already sued the, Ch- the CCP for thirty trillion dollars in federal court. Now I don't know if any of those will stick, but before we can even think of phase two or anything like that, the Chinese Communist Party has to turn over all the information related to the uh, P four lab in Wuhan about how this started to an independent uh, you know body for review. Josh Hawley's put in as part of the the deal for this is to require a commission a commission to be able to look in, a commission made up of the House and the Senate and other independent people to look into uh, the Chinese Communist Party's behavior during this entire process. So there's not going to be any phase two deal. They've got, to, they've got to answer to this first. They have to answer to the Chinese people. They have to answer to the United States. They have to answer to the world community of exactly what they did and, uh, and what they did by at least we know they suppressed the information. Right. And for, I think for four weeks to 60 days and uh, and we have to get in back of, uh, you know, exactly what the details were that why it happened, how it happened uh, until anything could go forward with uh, with considering the CCP is a legitimate government. I don't think the CCP is a legitimate government. I think they've now proven that they are a group of gangsters. Right. And they are their oppression of the Chinese people. What they've done to the Chinese people, they've now done to the people, uh, uh, to everybody in the world. Hmm. Secretary Pompeo also said in the recent press briefing that regarding China's early cover up that caused the spread of the virus in the world, the United States will do the after action when the time is right. And you just mentioned people being taking legal actions against the CCP. So from the U.S. government point of view, what do you think, Pres? Uh, what do you think Secretary Pompeo was uh, was talking about? What actions? What after actions will the U.S. government take? Uh, I think you're going to have a commission. I think you have an investigation. I think the United States is going to demand that the Chinese Communist Party explain themselves in detail, and I believe they're going to hold them accountable. President Trump has consistently gone out and said, "We know where this came from." And he said the other day it, w- it would have been nice if they had told people what they were. I think you're going to see many more voices to the right of President Trump 
start to demand action. And this is going to become a huge movement in the United States. The Chinese Communist Party is going to be held accountable for this. They're not going to be able to run away from this. The world community, the world business community, the world capital markets, the people of the world are going to demand accountability. I think the Chinese Communist Party has been spreading the narrative to shift blame, such as the virus came from America. And now they also claim all new cases came from people who are returning to China, who are from other countries. So if China had a second wave of the outbreak, it would definitely be caused by other countries. And thirdly, they are sending over doctors and ventilators to Italy and other countries. I think that's a good thing. We need to help each other. But by doing all of that, I think what the CCP is really trying to do is to uh, is to trying to transform their image from the culprit of this pandemic to a hero that saves the world. But do you think the world will buy that this time? I think where there's individual Chinese, you know, the Chinese people are among the most decent, hardworking people on earth and good people. I think the Chinese people understand what happened to them in Wuhan, uh, what happened to them in Hubei province and other places of China. They don't want that to happen to any any where else or anybody else in the world. And where you see the Chinese doctors, et cetera, going out, I think it's tremendous and a real compliment to the Chinese people. The Chinese Communist Party is a group of gangsters, okay? What they did to basically Wuhan are allowed to happen. Remember, if they had at all acted at the time that Dr. Lee and the heroes uh, of uh, in Wuhan City, the young medical doctors, led by Dr. Lee on the WeChat, if they had not taken those individuals and tortured them and forced them to sign uh, uh, confessions that were lies that said they were rumor mongers under threatening their family and torturing them, this thing would have been contained. If they had done it in early January, it would have been contained. We know from President Xi himself that he admits to having a conference call. He was forced to admit when people were questioning his leadership he admitted he talked to Wuhan and Ubei province officials on January 2nd or 3rd. So he knew this. He knew this before he sent a delegation to the White House. He knew this before he sent a delegation to Davos. He knew this, um, you know, before it all melted down in Wuhan. The blood of the dead of Wuhan are on the hands of President Xi. The blood of all the dead throughout the world are on the hands of President Xi. So all of the nonsense they make up about, um, you know, uh, where this came from and the U.S. Army, people understand that that's dismissed as a lie and a joke. And it also, I think, shows the desperation that the Chinese Communist Party is going to, the lengths they're going to and the desperation to try to convince the people of China that they're not culpable in this. But that's it's impossible to sell that. And I think that's one of the reasons that the firewall has to come down. You know, if you look at their guilt and you look at their crimes and they look at what they've done to the Chinese people, not to allow the firewall to come down during those horrific weeks in Wuhan uh, that could have saved many, many additional people, uh, to me, should never be forgiven. Uh, they can't be forgiven. They're, they're a criminal enterprise. They're the individually the worst people on earth. They are a threat to the health, vitality, uh, and prosperity of the of the Chinese people, and to me, uh, the Chinese people now should do whatever is in their 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 basic not just interest in in their in their survival to remove the Chinese Communist Party. Hmm. People have been advocating the term CCP virus. What do you think? I think it's the CCP virus. I've advocated to the White House. It's not a Chinese virus. It's not a Wuhan virus. This is the CCP virus. They knew about this and suppressed that information. They knew about it and forced these heroes like Dr. Lee to sign um, confessions that were they knew were lies to smear these individuals. Uh, they knew this happened and did not move rapidly enough in Wuhan because they did not want to signal to the world that there was a problem. And this is not going to go away. There's going to be other issues like this in the future. And that's why they've now proven to the world that they're the single biggest threat to humankind.
Italy and Taiwan are two examples we should pay special attention to. When the outbreak first erupted in China, a report from Johns Hopkins University identified Taiwan as being the worst hit region outside China due to its proximity to the mainland. Uh, but Taiwan has so far kept the coronavirus in check with only 67 confirmed cases and one death. On the other hand, Italy, to people's surprise, has become the epicenter outside China. So if you compare the two regions, um, they both have sophisticated healthcare systems, the population density are both high. So in your opinion, what made the difference? What did Italy do wrong and what did Taiwan do right? You know, President Trump says uh, the most important thing here is nothing is inevitable. And that means human action, human agency will be the determinant. And you see it perfectly in Taiwan and in Italy. In Italy, the officials had a bunch of half measures that were not coordinated. You know, they they thought that they very late came to the, the understanding they had to isolate certain areas. They isolated some towns in Lombardy in northern Italy. They they, you know, after Fashion Week or towards the end of Fashion Week, they started to shut down Milan. They never really shut down the entire country until it was too late. What Italy shows you is half measures that are half hearted uh, in their execution. And what you end up with is now a situation that's far worse than China was. In Taiwan, you see the exact opposite. Taiwan, South Korea are perfect examples of doing testing immediately, doing social distancing, right, immediately. And they, through their action of the government, through local official, and basically the people uh, who can govern themselves, showed you that you can, you can put this, uh, you can get this virus and, pa- and back you. Now, I hope it continues on in Taiwan. They, they continue to be very vigilant, but also using the malaria drug. So I think in South Korea and in Taiwan, you get a great example of taking human action and how you can lessen, uh, as President Xi says, this, uh, this demon that is this uh, virus. So I think there in Taiwan, you saw action that had an impact. And in Italy, you saw people trying to wish it away, and it didn't work. Hmm. Okay. It, you just said... Uh the Italian government had half measure, uh, half measures, and they closed down Lombardy, but not the whole country. And what about the U.S.? You you said uh, we need to crush, we need to flatten this curve. Do you think the whole country need to be locked down, or only part of it, hotspots? No, I think the entire country should be locked down immediately. I think that New York City should be put under quarantine immediately. I think we now have the financial bridge that will get us through the next two, three, four weeks. If, if that's not enough, we ought to pass another one. We cannot let the economy – this is not about stopping the virus and letting the economy collapse. You have to keep the economy going at a, at a sustaining level. That's what these cash infusions are about. You have to do that. you got to do more of it. But to me, you should take dramatic, draconian measures today to wring this out of the system. The whole key is to get the host – bodies, which are the human body, out of the flow of where the virus is. And I, it, we can do this. The Chinese, sh- the Chinese show you that it, in four or six weeks, this, this thing will pass if you take dramatic measures. If you don't, it's going to linger like it is. It's going to be devastating like it has been in, in Italy, and it's going to linger like it is in Italy. So it's what behooves you to do. If you don't get ahead of it like Taiwan and South Korea did, and for a host of reasons we didn't, we're past that stage. We're in the stage now that to me you have to crash, you have to shatter the curve, not not to uh, not to not to shorten the curve, not to flatten the curve. You have to shatter the curve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bandon. These are all my questions. Do you have anything else to add? The only thing I would have to add, I think you know, I've done a number of interviews with you, and I'm a huge believer in uh, your show, Zooming In, and uh, and NTD, the t- TV network, and also Epic Times that you guys are affiliated with. I think you do the best job in the world. Only thing I would say is that this whole confrontation with the CCP is just now going to begin because the entire world, I think they've shown to the world how dangerous they are and and what a danger they are to the Chinese people. Uh, If left unchecked, they will end up destroying the Chinese people just like they destroyed the people of Wuhan. And that should be an object lesson of what we're dealing with. Uh, And every uh, person in the world that's a free man or woman uh, should understand that the Chinese people in their decency and their humanity uh, have not had the ability to strike back. 
but that uh, but that time is coming. This is the the most important thing in the 21st century. We now have to accomplish is to assist the Chinese people in their freedom from the Chinese Communist Party. If we do that, if we assist the, Ch the Chinese people in their freedom and their quest for freedom, the rest of the century is going to take care of itself. If we don't do that, the Chinese Communist Party is only going to get more out of control. And they have proven that they are an illegitimate government by what, what they allowed to happen in this uh, in this pandemic, in the CCP, in the spread of the CCP virus. Thank you, Mr. Bannon. That's it for today's coronavirus special. You are watching Zooming In with Simone Gao. Please also download our podcast from Spotify, iTunes, and Google. And be sure to come back tomorrow.